Chicago was definitely, I know, at the top of our list when we were talking about it. And uh, also um, Philadelphia uh, was another city that came up for April. And uh, there's a lot of other cities on the list. So we're putting together the tour right now. And um, and I really look forward to you know doing that first stop with you. Well, well that, that's fine. And you know, what you, you're the 900 pound gorilla right now. I'm doing this because I've been asked to do it. I guess for over the last 15 or 20 years, but I never I declined it. I'm doing this out of respect and appreciation for you. And secondly, because I'm too tired to keep running and giving speeches all over the country. And and I have a lot of things I want to share with uh, with the country, with particularly with the black community. And I can't think of a more appropriate person professionally and personally speaking than you for me to do it with. And so I'm preparing my PowerPoint presentations. And uh, because right now we're in a desperate situation across this country. And I think that you're going to be the driving force that might reawaken this entire country for black folk. Well, well, I'm, I'm honored that you uh, that you say that. And I appreciate that. And uh, I'm, I know I'm doing everything in my power, you know, behind the scenes to make sure that we set this up and, and everything goes great and uh, all the cities get covered that we want to cover. Um, and I know you, you and I talked about even going internationally. Um, I think London is a great city. I, I mentioned earlier that I love London when I went there last year. Hundreds and hundreds of black folks came out and, uh, and I'd love to take you to London with me Would you, uh, if, you, if you'd like to go. But, well, well we, we'll work out something, as I said. You know, my, my wife's always opposed to my doing it long distance traveling, but, but I, I'll, I'll discuss that with you. But, but right now, <clears throat> I'm anticipating the first uh, uh, forum being in Chicago, right? Yep, yep. And and and, and uh, because I'm getting a lot a lot of inquiries coming in, and I told them I'll definitely be there, and uh, uh, and I'm working desperately quick to be able to get my uh, PowerPoint presentation in order, and um, so that way, so you can have a vacation for the first day. <laughs> I look forward to that. I look forward to that. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I think that it's, what, what's great about it, what, you know, what excites me about the, the, the one-two punch I think we can deliver is that, you know, you're, you're really, really, you are the, the, the foremost expert in, in the area of group economics in terms of what a community can do to empower itself uh, politically as well as uh, just collective economic strategies, uh, vertical and horizontal integration, all these things that can build industry. And, uh, and I love coming in and talking about what you can do in your own family, you know, with your own bank account, with your own, you know, situation right there. So that when we, when this army's built, and I see it like an army, really, uh, when the army's built, you become the best soldier that you can be. You know, I, I really think that people are going to benefit from this a lot. Well, well I, I think it's going to work out well. And, uh, and as, I, as I said, I, I'm trying to, to anticipate the largest possible crowds you can get wherever, whatever venue you establish. I know in Chicago that the um, Harold Washington Center should hold about 600, 700 people. And um, I guess the biggest thing I'm going to need is just get me a, <laughs> get me a, a slide projector and a screen. And, uh, uh, but, and I want black folk to be able to walk out of there with some kind of a diploma or certificate indicating they've gone through the power economics seminar. And they now understand the two, the two primary elements of it, understanding in very comprehensive analytical terms the real reason that we were been in, that we fought for 500 years to get out of a ditch and have moved one inch. That's the first thing. That's, and that's in the morning session. The second evening is to say, now we're going to change everything, our perceptions and everything, and how and our code of behavior and code of conduct. And so the evening session will be based on here's how you get out of it. Here are the key elements of getting out of it. And also with, and well, finally, in the final few minutes, I'll tell them exactly how we're going to establish a national network to make sure they rebuild these black communities, start these businesses, and understand how to redistribute wealth back into the black community. So they're gonna get a lot of beneficial things out of the understanding of how the system work, how to how to practice group economics, how to practice group politics, and I'll be showing you my, you know, I'll be using probably based on my five-story building, why it's important, critically important that black folk rebuild these communities based on a common need, a country, a common interest, and a common goal, and go from that five-story all the way up to the fifth floor, which would be going from economics to the base floor, once you build your community, start building an economy, then taking the money and resources that you produce in that economy and move to the second floor, boys, to learn how to practice politics and use politics as a key element. And it contrary to what black folk have been taught and indoctrinated and cultivated to believe, politics has no strength and power if it doesn't have an economy behind it. And that's why what you're going to be teaching the follow day buffers that and, and, uh, and, and supports it. You've got to have an economy for politics to work. And I'll tell them why it doesn't work. We go through that. Then the third floor, you take that money that you got off the first floor and you build, you get started to learn how to control 
the court system and the police system in this country, just like everybody else does. Then in the fourth floor, we're gonna start talking about the importance of having a communication system, you know, radios, television, t- newspapers, and everything else, and how to go about getting that. And the fifth floor will be education. And contrary to what you've been probably been hearing all your life, that education is, information is power. Information is not power. It's never been power. Information is only has a potential for power. And that potential can only be exercised or, 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 or exposed once you have a system to tie it into. And otherwise, the safest people on earth are teachers and educators. So we got to go back and try to show them how to make them into a power force. That'll be on the floor floor. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, our people have been taught for centuries that a five-story building, instead of starting on the first floor of the economics, they've been taught that, that, can, that their salvation is to get an education. And to jump from the sidewalk all the way to the fifth floor is impossible for them to do. Mm. That's, why they have, that's why education has been totally nullified by the fact you, have, you don't have an economy. And uh, an education has never been black folks' a savior. Mm. And because there's never, there's never been a connection between, between getting an education and getting benefits. Mm. You, know, you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, um, it's funny, I, I've had people, um, I've had to explain to people my position on education because, you know, I was an educator for a long time. I was, um, I was a college pre- professor for a very long time. And, um, and I started asking openly, you know, why are we going, you know, why you got people going seventy, eighty thousand dollars in debt to get this college degree? but they're not seeing the benefits from it. You know, the, I don't know if you noticed it. I don't know if I mentioned that to you, the average black college graduate um, uh, is, is probably going to die in debt. That basically uh, half of black college graduates default on their student loans. So that means they got bad credit and all this other stuff that comes with not being able to pay the debt. Also the average balance, if you look at the average balance of a black college graduate and you look at that balance of the student loan debt, you know, five, six, 10 years later, that balance doesn't go down, it actually goes up. So for the average student, if they owe 50,000 when they finish school, they owe 60,000 a decade later because they've not paid a penny on their debt. And so it makes you kind of get back to saying, you know, if you got all this education, you got all these degrees, you got all this other stuff you're supposed to have to be successful, why are you not successful? You know, why are you not free? You know, uh, so, so I think the first thing we gotta confess to ourselves is that the approach we've been using is not working. <laughs> we need a better well, approach. You, well, you're, you're absolutely right. See, what nobody ever tells black students that education is no more than a tool, just like a hammer, saw, or anything else. It has no, it has no effect if it's not, if it's not used appropriately. Right now, uh, if I give, if I told you right now, I'm gonna build a house, and uh, and I'm a, and uh, I give you a tool, then you know how you're gonna build it. You can build a house. But right now, black folk wind up with a with a doctor's degree, master's degree, be at bachelor's degree. They have no place to apply that tool. What are they gonna apply it on? They don't have the community, they don't have any businesses, they don't have any industries. So consequently, when they go to college, just in business, for instance, with that, that things that you've been focusing on, <laughs> try to acculturate them to understand. Most of our black colleges would teach something like, uh, they'll teach business administration. Now, business administration, what does that mean? That means, well, that would teach you how to administer and run other people's business. I don't need a black folk learning how to run other people's business. Back when I was a kid, they used to call, <laughs> they, they call it blacks will get an education and become household servants. They go out and take care of other people's house, spend a whole all day washing clothes, cleaning up people's house, taking care of other body else's home except their own. And what I need black folks to do is cease and desist and look at the business administration and start talking about business development and, and industrialization for black folk. See, the whole thing is off. And see, and that's why that's why it's imperative and important in your program now to go across this country and start telling people information is nothing but a tool. If you have no place to apply it, it's useless. That's why I got all these black kids graduating from, with master's degree and doctor's degree working at McDonald's and Taco Bell as clerks in the window, in the drive through windows. They have no place to apply it. They got, they got master's degrees, but they master nothing because mm-hmm. the schools have never taught them how to build and, and, and how to build and develop. They go to school just to be someone's servant. And that's been true ever since after the Civil War, when the first educational system built this country was a public school system. They weren't built for whites, they were built for black folk all those black children that have been that are slaves and blacks to get an education because prior to, to the end of the civil war, it was against the law. It was against the law, Dr. Watkins, for a black person to be taught to read and write. Yet if you get, got caught talking about or teaching a black person to read or write, it would cost you 100 lashes and $39.39 lashes to be caught teaching a black person to read and write. Mm. And in the South, it was a death sentence. 
matter of fact, black folk that went around the plantations, even those who, who accidentally could learn how to read and write, if white folks found out about it, that would be a death sentence. So they played, they had to dumb themselves down. Even during, this, during Jim Crow segregation, the black person going south, the worst thing he can do is have a newspaper in his, pre, in his possession and go into the south. White folk found that Negro can need read and write. And they, mm -hmm. he wound up being wrong and lynched. Because you see, they, they were intentionally dumbed down. And black folks started to learn how to play and pretend they were, they were, they, they were ignorant. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so they, they injected uh, ignorance on black folk. So, and the schools just went up just one level. So after, sec after Civil War, they taught them, well, we'll teach you how to be a, uh, we'll teach you manual arts, but we'll not teach you to be in a com competition with whites. And the only, only school that I told you last time I was on your program, the only school that after the Civil War that was allowed to even teach black folk competitive skills with whites was Howard University. And see, Howard University, because that was governmental subsidized, and that was the uh, institution for the offsprings of white congressmen who had black mistresses and black children would go to Howard. And consequently, there they can go to Howard because they, they, they can be taught professional skills. They can have a hospital. Well, the black school could have hospitals then. They could have an engineering school. They could have a law school. Well, those would be competitive skills with, for, for black kids to acquire. And black folks still have not understood it is absolute insanity to think that somehow you're going to socially integrate and go into a school system for the white kids and the white teachers have the same commitment and interest to elevate blacks intellectually and professionally to be competitive with white kids. There's no motives for that, no motivational for that, and there's no incentives and products and benefits for doing that. Whites are not gonna teach black kids to be competitive with white kids. You gotta have your own school system. So when we get to that fifth floor in our workshops, in our seminars, as you go across this country, we're gonna, we're gonna find out what kind of school system black folk really need. I could tell you today, but I'm gonna hold that in advance, okay? Okay, well, you know, that's, um, you know, that's interesting what you said about, um, education and uh, this idea that you can learn how to you know, do business management, business administration, but you ain't got no businesses to manage or administrate. You know, <laughs> you, you, you ain't got, you know <laughs> all you can do is go across town, you know, to go across this business and say, you know, can I, can I administer your business for you? <laughs> you know, and and it, it, it's comical, really. It, it's really funny. And it's, um, you know, you know my, my term for that has always been, uh, I call it economic <laughs> babysitting, you know, where, where you're trained to nurture a child and, and nurse a child and raise a child, but you don't have no kids. You never get a chance to have a child of your own. You're spending mm -hmm. all your time raising somebody else's babies. And a lot of us, we get attached to that. We get attached to those roles, you know, like we take pride in that. We say, you know, look at me. I am the vice president of this comp of Bank of America. Look at me. I'm with, uh, I'm with IBM and, and they just gave me a promotion to manager. But you don't see many people taking pride in saying, I'm the CEO of a new company that I just started that's owned by me and my family. That doesn't get the same respect that you get if you say that white man over there just gave me this promotion and maybe he made me important. He gave me my status. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so it's interesting. I, 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 just just say, so please feel free to jump in because I know everything I say, you're going to have a thought that goes with it. Do you have a thought you want to share? No, 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 you, no you're, right, you're right on target. What, what I started laughing because it reminded me of one, uh, one school in Florida. And, uh, and see, I was, over, I was over the state education system for eight, almost eight years. That's both the public sector and the private sector, from the nursery schools to the graduate schools in the universe. I had all of them underneath me. But I used to go over to one of the black schools and and they had, they had, a, they had a, a program what they called business administration. And I used to ask them, I said, I said uh, why are you teaching business administration? They said, because Dr. Anspoor, we got the best business uh, graduates, business graduates in the United States. I said, what do you mean by this? They said, well, our kids are some of the best. Uh, they, we, then when they graduate, they're working for Anheuser-Busch, they're working for Procter & Gander, they're working for Xerox. And I said, wait a minute now. I said, and you're teaching business administration. I said, if you be, where are the black businesses? I said, if I go from Jacksonville, Florida, all the way to Pensacola, across North Florida, I said, I'll find about three substantive black businesses in that, in that, in that about four or 500 mile distance. I said, what is, I said, so you, you couldn't be putting out the best business schools, a business graduates, because you don't see, you don't have any businesses. And the biggest business at that particular time was in Tallahassee, Florida. And then that was, that was my radio station. I built WWD, tell and tell us because whites wouldn't play wouldn't play black music. So I built a I built a radio station for black folk that threw a signal almost from Jacksonville to Panama City. And now my business when I said I didn't graduate from your school. 
And I said, the only other in Tallahassee, Florida, you only got about three black businesses in that whole city. You might have a, you might have a, uh, you got, you got a, 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 you got a drugstore down there, and you had one other thing. I can't think of the other business, and my, and my business, and 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 one real estate office. And I didn't go to your school. If you have, if you had the best business graduates, you should have the best schools. And you have no business across North Florida, so you're teaching the wrong thing. What you should be teaching is business development and business industrialization. Since black people are the only people on earth, Dr. Watkins, that were deprived of an opportunity to learn and experience from industrialization. So why would you be teaching, if you're the only people, when, when, when industrialization went across Europe in the 1700s, blacks were slaves. When industrialization came through the United States in the 1800s, black folk were slaves. Black people are the only people on earth that have never enjoyed the fruits and benefits of being in, taught industrialization how to build industries. So why would you be teaching a business administrator for them to take care of somebody else's house and they can't even build their own house? And so consequently, we'll talk about that. That's the fifth story, and but you're right on target. So I want all these blacks to understand education is a tool. It's a device to be used to enhance you. And, it's in, and, and, and plus that if you get an education, there should be a connection between the fruits of having that education. And never, never in the history of this world, in this earth, a black folk who got an education never got the full benefits of having that education mm. because the edu because, because benefits doesn't follow a blacks with crease. That's why, as, as an example, <clears throat> let me give you an early example. Let's see when, when the Civil War ended in 1865 because of imposed ignorance on black folk by codes of conduct and laws that the typical at the end of slavery in 1865, Dr. Watkins, the average black. 96% of them were totally were illiterate, intentionally imposed and burdened by ignorance. 96% could not read and write in 1865. But in 30 years, by 19, but by 19, uh, by uh, 1817, no, 1896, they they reduced their illiteracy rate by starting their own schools from again from 96% down to about 44, 45%. That is the highest academic educational achievement on earth. In contrary to what, pe what people keep telling you in books and stuff about, and, and in public relationships and in political uh, spheres, that whites, that uh, Jews and, and Asians are the brightest people and, and have the, and the, some of the brightest educational uh, achievements on earth. That's a lie. Black folk hold the record for academic achievement. In that 30 year time period between 1865 and 1895, black folk reduced their literacy rate in half. No human beings on earth have ever come out of slavery and in 30 years, almost by themselves, cut their illiteracy rate in half. Now, mm. during that same 30-year period, during that same 30-year period, we had immigrants pouring in. We had about 27, about 24, 25 million immigrants coming in this country from Europe. Guess what? Their illiteracy rate was 96% too. Most of them could not read and write. 96% of the immigrants coming to this country could not read and write. As a matter of fact, the people who wrote the United States Constitution in present-day contemporary terms that they, their education was about, about a four or fifth grade education. All those people that you think are all the founding fathers. But black folk, though, set the highest achievement. But during the course of that 30 year period, when those immigrants came in here with a 96% illiteracy rate, <clears throat> they came and became the management class. And black folks stayed at the bottom. They brought in all those Europeans over here who had, who, had, who had the same illiteracy rate that blacks had had. But they came in, but they went over black folks and blacks went to the bottom. There was no benefit for black folk reducing their religious rate, cutting their illiteracy rate in half. They didn't get any benefits. So by 1950, by 1950, what happened is that a black college graduate in the United States, like a teacher and anybody else, could not, could not earn what a white person would earn. That a black person with a college degree in the 1950s could only earn, they earned less than one half of what a high school dropout earned. Mm. because there was no direct connection between black folk getting a degree and getting wealth and resources. And that comes from the fact that they failed to build an economy at the bottom on the first floor. They have no place to apply their tools. And they don't care how much education you get, Dr. Watkins. It makes little different if the people who are going to determine the value of education is in another great race and in another community. You come in there with all kinds of degrees, and they say, as far as we're concerned, we don't need you. So you got a doctor's degree, but your education to us is still at the level of a janitor because you got no place to use it. You don't have a community. You don't have any business. You don't have any industries. You don't have any factories. So nobody needs your education. We're just being kind and generous by giving you a job outside your community. There you go. I, I don't have anything to add to that.
you know, I think that, um, you know, one of the things I've always, from the very beginning, <clears throat> when we put together the Black Business School, I told the students, I said, I'm not trying to put together a class. You can go get a class at a lot of places. We're trying to build an economy. You know, that means that everybody that's coming through, everybody that's learning, everybody that's graduating, you know, everybody's getting certifications from us. We, we form networks so that you have the ability to develop the ecosystems that you need in order for industrialization to take place, in order for investment to occur, in order for you to work with each other, work for each other, share networks for customers, contractors, and all that stuff. And you keep your money, you keep your expertise, you keep it all in-house. You know, you got you to gotta bring it back. And it seems to me that in the way a lot of our families run, you can have a family full of very skilled black people. You know, you might have a doctor or a lawyer, an engineer, and all in the same family. And all of them take their energy and their intelligence, they point it outward. You know, the doctor goes to work for this other, this man over here, the lawyer's working for this person over here, the engineer's working over there. And, and, and it's none of us being kept inside the family, almost like opening the window and letting the air condition just, just the air just go out the window instead of shutting the window so the air can circulate, you know? And so to me, economic systems are supposed to be built in a way where the circulation is, is kept contained and I think when it comes to our money and our resources and our skill, it's not contained. We, we, but to the point where we're serving everybody else, we're boosting everybody else up. And then we wonder why when we come home after we finish working for that white man across town, why there's nothing there. You know, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing happening in the neighborhood that we wake up in, but all the industrialization is happening across town and we are fueling that industrialization with our so-called education. Well, you're, you're right on target, so that's why I'm very hopeful that your program and your tour this this year will, will produce some fruits for black folk to finally come to understand there's a major difference between acquiring income and acquiring wealth. What they don't have is wealth. Wealth is the key. And most of our blacks, even in slavery, when they performed into slavery, they are always sick in full employment. They were full-time employees in slaves. They had full-time employment, but, they, but there's no connection between them getting benefits out of it. And see, and, and so most of our people now, what they want to do is get a job for income. There's a difference between performance income and wealth. Uh, wealth is wealth is what you have left after you got to have an income. You pay your bills and pay off your own debts, and what and, and consequently, most blacks don't have any wealth. They form in the which we start to look at all these black black artists and black entertainers and black athletes and all this. That's performance based income. Mm. That's not that is not wealth. There's a major difference between wealth and income. And uh, we're gonna be talking about that in your workshops and these seminars be going across the country to understand the difference. The fruits, the fruits of wealth is comes from labor. And see, when, when you black folk labored in the fields, they produce wealth, but guess who got it? The plantation owner. them. They, and see, and that's why the greatest wealth building in this nation was black slavery. Mm -hmm. and labor from black folk, but they never got the benefits. And black folk, a black person, a slave was like an, like an express card, a visa card. The, the white man didn't have to work all day, he was sitting that black out in the day, to work all day long and come on, but get, he get paid for it. Mm. And that's why, that's like I hear Washington DC, black folk, black slaves and free blacks built Washington DC, all the major buildings, everything you can think of, but they didn't get paid for it. The person that owned the back got paid. So why in the world would black folk be educating black folk to still go out and work, to leave their communities, Dr. Watts, to leave their communities across America, to leave their dress up, clean up, and go and catch a bus and go to somebody else's neighborhood, somebody else's community, and look for a job so they can work for them and provide and produce wealth, resources, products, and, and income for them. That takes you back to, to 1630 when Marilyn Perth passed the first slave in code law, which says that black people in America would never be permitted to enjoy the fruits of white society, that they are there to provide comfort and relief and wealth for whites. That was that was set up in 1638. You haven't changed if you're just teaching business administration. You're teaching somebody else to take care of somebody else's business, take care of somebody else's home, take care of somebody else's community. And hopefully this program you're going to try to run this summer. That's why I'm, I'm just proud to be working with you on this. We're going to try to stop that and reacculturate blacks and change their entire perceptions. And we're going to go after their perception, perception levels. Okay. Yes, we will. We will. I, um, you know, I, I, I think that, I think that what you're doing is incredibly important um, for obvious reasons. And I think that, you know, one of the things I think is really important, everybody who's listening, first of all, if you, if you don't know who I'm talking to is Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, he's the author of the book, uh, Powernomics. I actually have a copy right here in front of me. 
<clears throat> I keep my power nomics book with me every almost everywhere I go. Um, I, I, I want everybody, you know, that believes in this to understand what we're trying to do. What we're really trying to do is a 50, 100 year project. Um, I, you know, I want you to commit to making sure that your children are aware of the concepts behind poweronomics, uh, that they're aware of, of sort of how this game is skewed against them, and, and also just aware of what, you know, what the pillars of wealth are, you know, where, where the real prizes are located, um, because they're gonna hear a lot of messages all throughout their life from people that will say, oh, well, just go to school and get a degree so somebody will give you a good job and all this other stuff. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't go to school. It doesn't mean you shouldn't get the degree and all that stuff. And, and nobody's making fun of you if you have a job, but that's not the real prize. That's not where the power is at. Being close to another man's power does not mean you got power. It, it, that's his power. So that's why you see, when you see folks, you know, you'll see folk, black folks, they become overcommitted to the system to the point where the you know the white man they work for takes their power away and they're ready to go jump off a bridge. You ever seen that? They they like I need to take antidepressants and I had to see a therapist because these white people when they took what they well they took something away from you that was never yours. The reason you're going crazy because you was living off an illusion that was never your power to begin with. That's why they took it. You know, so I think that you know just sort of I know for myself when I went through that journey where I started realizing how the world actually works. Um, I really like the poweronomics principles because it was built on something I understood just from being an athlete. You know, I remember, you know, when I used to run track and play football, I knew basic things that said, you know, your, your opponent is never going to give you any points for free. You know, so us waiting for white folks to give us things is, 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 flaw, is a flawed strategy, ain't gonna work. Um, I also knew that your opponent is gonna try every trick in the book to distract you, to stop you, to undermine you, whatever. And he might even cheat, right? And, 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 and so I know that in, in the real world, that's the way the world works, you know? And, and I also know that when you see your opponent distracting you and cutting off your, you know, stopping your offense and doing all these things to stop you, you can't cry about it. You got to figure it out. You got, you know, you can, make, you can be upset, but then you, after you get upset, you got to sit down and draw a better game plan so you can win. I also know that in a football game, if you want to beat the opponent and score more touchdowns than them, that you're going to have to practice. You got to be ready. You know, you can't practice for the game while you're in the game. You got to practice for the game before the game starts. You know, so uh, in my mind, if, you know, as we're getting ready for the big games in the future, our children and grandchildren will be playing in the big games. They're going to be playing in the super, the economic Super Bowl of life, right? Which means that we got to make sure that they are well trained, that they have gone through the X's and O's, that they know every strategy, that they know their opponent, that they know how to score points, that they know how to play defense, and all of this so that they don't get fooled into the game. Because right now, we're like the football team that gets on the field and just hands the ball over to the other person because they asked for it. You know, or they come up and say, well, you know, just, just give us the ball every time you get it. And every touchdown we'll get, we'll give you half the points, you know. And that, that's really what we think. Like, we give away all of our wealth, all of our power, and we waiting for some. and we get mad because they don't give anything back. Well, that's because we don't understand how the game is played, you know. So I, I like Poweronomics because it talks about exactly how the country got to be where it is. It talks about exactly how Europeans got their power, exactly how we got duped, and exactly how we can fix it. And so everybody in here, please have your children read that book before they read anything else. Uh, and and that, that's what I got to say on that. Do, uh, Dr. Anderson, please go, go ahead. I said a lot. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right on target. What I was thinking about. And see, and, and there, because you have, you have two of the key books for them. That's uh, Black Label, White Wealth, which shows how, how the wealth was intentionally maldistributed throughout this country. And Black, and, and, and I never hear any civil rights leaders uh, trying to resolve the conf racial conflicts by saying, let's go back to the purpose of slavery. What was the purpose of slavery? Purpose of slavery was intentionally to maldistribute almost 100% of all this nation land, mm. resources, businesses, income, privileges, rights, and controls of all levels of government to the hands of the dominant white society. That was what it was set up for. Now, and that means you came out that black folk wound up with zero and whites wound up with 99 and one half percent. So now how are you gonna play in a game by talking about, well, we need equality. You can't get equality 
I'll let you go back and redistribute the resources and the wealth and private, private and privileges and all these things. They have never done that. Mm. And, and, see, and one, one of the greatest, uh, I guess, jokes is to talk about, keep talking about equal opportunity and equality in a society where, where 99 and one half percent of everything has been male distributed. And they said, what are you going to get? Well, I like to have a little social illusion. Let me have a little, I could pretend that, uh, that I got something. And I said, yeah, I, said, I, said, I remember that. Because the guy, uh, George Gershwin, wrote that song back in 19, 1935 at that opera, Porgy and Bess, to summarize black folks' attitudes about that, where Porgy is out in the middle of a black neighborhood singing, I've got plenty of nothing, and nothing is plenty for me. And we still believe that. Black folk, nobody shows black folk how to get the thing we miss it, and that is wealth and control of these resources. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that never happens. And if you won't go back to slavery again, that, that, see, blacks never have been taught the social construct that we're embedded in. We are locked into a social construct. And I said, you know what the so I don't know what a social construct is. How can you get out of something you don't even know what it is? Mm -hmm. The social construct was set up. And then that's in that code, in that social construct, you know what key elements in it? I don't know that. I said the first one was called uh, a doctrine of unequal exchange. That was the first thing put into the social construct. That means that whatever black folk come up with, we're going to take it from and they get nothing in return. That's why, they, that's why uh, when they went to Africa and they were buying black folk for $25 a piece and bring them to the United States and having those black folk produce, produce every year so much wealth and income for them. White, would spend, a white plantation owner would spend something like about, typically about $12 a year to, uh, to, to, to support a slave. But he demanded he gets $50 to $60 in return for, for, that, for that slave every, every year for his investment. And that's where capitalism all that started. Nobody tells black folk that the doctrine of unequal exchange applies to, to black music, for instance. Black folk, black folk have the genius and talent for creating music in this country and the dance and the slang. They've been doing that for centuries. But guess who dominates and controls those things? It's white companies and white opera, and it's the Benjamins. They control it. Black folk don't control the music industry. They never have. That's why, whether it's jazz, blues, Dixieland, or whatever it is, rhythm and blues, or any kind of music comes up in the history. When whites came to America, they only brought one basic form of music, and that was classic music. And the only thing they say with opera and doing dances, they, they did. They had they had uh, they had certain kind of operatic dances. That was it. All the dances, even the country and western music, came out of the black lexicon. Blacks produce all the music in this country, but guess who benefits everybody but blacks? Mm. And the king of any kind of music is whites in this country. That's that's what you call doctrine of unequal exchange. But any time slavery was a doctrine of unequal exchange. Blacks worked, but they didn't get any benefits. But in but in your in your programs, in my in our seminars, we're going to talk about all these things. I'm going to show, break them all down and show them, show you in factual, quantitative terms and qualitative terms exactly how, how all those schemes work. Mm. They're going to learn in your program that every scheme they use in the in the social construct to make sure they lock and box black folks so they never get any benefits, and how they corrupted everything that should have benefited black folks was corrupted through a whole another bunch of schemes. We're going to itemize all those schemes that are used to keep black folk contained. That's why I want every black folks that can walk, crawl, or jump, or run to get to your program to be there. Mm -hmm. I, want, I, want, I want lines lined up for blocks away, two or three blocks away trying to get to your program when you hold these, these sessions or, uh, or, or workshops in these various cities starting with Chicago. Well, you know, I, I, I look forward to it. And, you know, really when I think about, you know, my vision for the community um, long term, you know, I would love to see, uh, you know, 50 years from now, where we've got you know hundreds of, of our own schools all across the country, uh, of course thousands of more businesses, and really our children all kind of understanding that your outcome in the game is determined by which position you choose to play. Like if you walk into the economic system hoping to be a laborer, then that's pretty much what you're going to be. You you know if you if if you go into in, in, like my daughter for example, my daughter told me she loved hair, beauty, and makeup. And, I, and she said, was there something wrong with that? I said, no. She said, well, you're a professor. You know, I don't know how you feel about your, your being a professor with your daughter being a hairstylist. I said, no, there's more money in the hair and beauty industry than anywhere else. I said, and you're damn good at what you do and you love it. So you should definitely pursue it. I said, the question you must ask yourself is which position do you want to play? Do you want to be a stylist in the hair salon working for some big corporation where they're telling you what to do and they're paying you a, a, a whatever wage they want to pay you? Or do you want to be a CEO who's running a chain of hair salons around the country? You know, like what, what position do you want to play? And so a lot of times, you know, oppression, I have found, it becomes a two-way street, a two-person tango. 
You know, we can, while we can certainly say, you know, we know what the white man's going to do. We know he, he knows his role in white supremacy. He knows what his part is, and he plays that very well. But what we don't talk about is the fact that we become complicit in that whole process. You know, if they decide in this room, all the whites would be in the front and the blacks would be in the back. Well, you know, sometimes you, you got some blacks that get, need to get told to go to the back. And then you got some blacks who go straight to the back without being told. You know, because that's where they, they, they say, well, this is, where, this is where the niggas are supposed to be. So I'm going to be in the back with the niggas, right? So I think that ultimately what uh, I want to see is our children going into the economic system. They're all going to play the economic game. I want to see them go into the system with a mindset that says, okay, I'm going into this in a way where I want to be the boss of something. I want to be the investor. I want to be the industrializer. I want to be the owner. I want to be the business developer. Um, you know, let, I think we need to kill all the conversation that says, I hope that somebody will just give me a job. If, that should be your fallback option. That should be what you do if you can't make nothing else work out. But I think that we have a lot of captains of industry. We have a lot of children who could have been billionaires, who could have run companies that employ thousands of black folks, but they never reached that potential because they never aimed for it. You know, if you but set your see, see, goal, in, in that regard, boy, in that in regard, Boris, why would a black person, why would a black family encourage this kid to go out and look for a job? Why would they do that in the first place? Why, why would you why would you send your kid off to college to get an education and then come back and get a job? And mm -hmm. see, that's, that's, that's the first question. And now the reason I'm, I'm asking that question, because on the opposite side of that, the answer is that 87% of all the income that whites get in the society, since, they, since the, you never corrected the whole purpose and benefits that came out of slavery, 87% of their income is unearned. They don't work for it. So mm -hmm. why would you suddenly tell your people to go out and get a job where they can work? That is counterproductive. Nobody's that that's stupid. <laughs> and they, they, they get their... They get their they draw their money and their wealth from all the, all the wealth they have embedded in trust accounts, saving accounts, in the factories, buildings, businesses, and capital gains, and uh, insurance policies, and trust accounts. They don't, and and for, 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 for rentals, for property, for business property of their own, and, from rent, and, rent, and apartment complexes. Why do you keep telling our people, I'm just talking, I'm not talking about you now, I'm talking about in general. Why, why would our pe leaders keep telling our what they need is a job? Black folk don't need jobs. You don't, if you got the wealth, you don't need a job. Mm. Uh, Donald Trump doesn't have a job. Mm. All he does, he's acquired enough wealth by what his father did in terms of running all kinds of illicit acti activities with, with prostitution and drugs and stuff in, in New York places. He, he doesn't have, he got, he got inheritance. Inheritance that all the, all the wealth that was gained in this country, that whites got free when they came to the country. It's been passed on from one generation to the next for 21 generations have gotten it. They didn't work for it. Mm. They got it through inheritance. 87% of what they get is inherited. 81, 87.5% means that every white child, the day he's born, I've said this to you before, 87% of everything that he gets, he gets it at birth when mm. he's born in the hospital because everything, almost 99% of everything he needs is in his community, in his church, in his schools, in his universities in his bank account, in his industries, in his factories. He can hit it every day when he wants to. Mm. The black child comes to this earth with zero. There's nothing in his neighborhoods. A neighborhood is an empty bucket with holes in it. And mm. right now, 80, that 70% of all these black folk right now are living around these industrial areas. They own nothing. They own nothing. Mm. In Washington, D.C., I just told you, in Washington, D.C., Chocolate City. Chocolate City was a prime development area for social economic development for black folk in America. In Washington, D.C., this has been gentrified and privatized in the last, about the last 20 years. I look at the whites in the, in the city of Washington, D.C., look at their net worth in terms of worth. That's what net, net worth means, personal worth. I look at the, the typical white person in, in Washington, D.C. right now, today, as we're speaking, they got $235,000 worth of personal worth. Mm. Just in this one Compared to the average black person in Chocolate City, you know what his personal worth is? Thirty-five hundred. Mm. Wow, wow. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you what. Um, and, 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 and let me let me wrap it by telling you. Right now, I got two white men right now in America got more wealth than all forty-four million black people that put together. And you got over. I got two whites in America. They've got more wealth than all 44 million black folk put together. And on top of that, make it worse. And these are billionaires, multi-billionaires. You got 
you got, you got well, the guy owns um, uh, Amazon. He's about worth about $115 billion. And, uh, and, the, and the thing about it is that you got about almost 600 white billionaires in America. And you got about one or two blacks. What kind of games are people talking about? Talking about you want equal opportunity. You cannot have equal quality and you cannot have equal opportunity unless you own and control equal amount of resources. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll let you, uh, I, I'm not even going to respond to that because I want everybody to kind of process what Dr. Anderson just said. Um, what we're really proposing to you is a new paradigm, a new way of thinking, you know, and, uh, and this is going to be seen as radical. Uh, we, we like being radical. But radical is a good thing. Um, and uh, because radical means that you're going to solve an old problem with a new solution instead of trying to solve an old problem with an old solution. Old solutions don't work. Uh, we've given it all a try. We, we, get, we tried, you know, voting for Hillary every election or whoever the, the new Hillary Clinton is, whatever that is. We've tried, you know, looking for jobs. We tried all these other pathways. Now, let's try some power nomic strategies. Now, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, if it's okay, I want to uh, run through a few questions uh, from the students. Uh, okay, and, fine. If that's all right. Knock, yourself, knock all right. yourself out. All right. So Clinton Wilbur is asking about uh, black colleges, the first black colleges. He says, uh, do you know if they were all started by the Freedmen's Bureau, all the, the black colleges, or well, the first ones? What, what, ask the question again now. Uh, Clinton was asking, do you know if all the first black colleges were started by the Freedmen's Bureau? Um, to, to a degree, yes. Uh, but, but some of them was, came from philo philosophical groups. and. Um, that had and some private sector people had some money. You had a you had a few abolitionists that threw in some money and helped build a couple of them. So it was a mixture and a blend of it. But they, but most of the public schools started off it, as it came out of the Freedmen Bureau, which put them in a, in a protective class, set up a protective class for blacks for education. And those schools, um, agriculture-based schools, went across the country. But also, and that's by the by the late by the late 1800s, a few blacks had started businesses like funeral homes and insurance companies and and churches, and they went, they also pool a lot of money, put it into a pot. And black people themselves started walking the streets, sometimes selling selling flowers, pies, and wood and coal and ice. They, they chip in to help build some of these colleges. So it came, so black colleges came out of a of, of a product of a lot of people's pooling their little resources in in, mm. in, in addition to the Freedom Bureau. Well, you know, yeah, but you know, I, I always point out Simmons College in Kentucky that was built by former slaves. And end up educating thousands of blacks. You know, I think that, um, you know, one of the things I think that provides an opportunity is the fact that it doesn't cost a lot of money to build a school if you have people willing to do what it takes to uh, make that school operational. So I, I personally think if we, by just supporting uh, the black schools that exist already, the black independent schools that are out here, and building a few of our own, uh, we, you know, just on an efficient budget, I think we could educate a lot of our own children. What do you think? Yeah, but a part of the problem you got now is that since the integration illusion, social illusion was set into place, that a lot of black colleges have been weakened down almost nothing. Mm. They're no longer really black colleges anymore. And right now, I think if I were to start at the instructional level, probably about, I would say about 65% of all the instructors in black colleges are not even black anymore. Yeah. And then, and, and, and under the pu public policies that was set in to neutralize blacks, blacks' potential for getting power and wealth, they, they made them, they, they, they followed the, uh, the admonishments of um, Martin Luther King that says, let's be colorblind. And so now you can go in these schools and they can't even teach very, very strong black history or black, any kind of thing dealing with the enrichment of black folk. Mm -hmm. And they're restricted from having to hold a lot of black events. They say you're too black. So blacks now have been neutralized down almost to nothing. And even things like um, um, black college, the HBUC's funds that were coming out was set up strictly for black colleges and in, 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 in out of the Freeman Bureau in, in those days. Now they, they, they watered that down. Back in about 1996, they got it. They, they passed a, uh, a policy saying that all the money that was previously set aside for black, historical black colleges, that now any white college, Dr. Watkins, any white college that has a, at least a 20 to 21% Hispanic population can now ac access and go into those black funds and take them out and use them. Mm. They now, and uh, then they started this thing by the United Negro College Fund, and see, and, and about eighteen in the nineteen eighteen uh, nineteen mid nineteen nineties, at that point in time, and uh, and Anheuser not the Anheuser Busch, I can't uh, can think of the group, but anyway, they um uh, they began to, to to water down the Negro United Negro College Fund, 
mm-hmm. and then and they, and said and they told them that we at and an Annisburg group says we'll give you millions of dollars if you in fact take the focus off of blacks and make it available for everybody. And they had Colin Powell going there as one that Golden Powell was working. And so they changed it from being the United Negro College Fund to being the fund. It was cut short to just the fund. So anybody could tap in and get those monies. So you gotta understand it. You gotta understand the social construct. You're not gonna get it from any place else except for your power economics presentation that you're gonna do across this country to get all this information. Otherwise, they're gonna still be whistling Dixie and not understand the issues. If you don't understand what's going on, you'll never find the right way to get out of it. Mm. All right, uh, let's see, Diane is asking, uh, do you know anything about Timbuktu? Timbuktu? Yeah, uh, I guess he should. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I know, well, well I, I, the Arabs went in there and, and Arabs started going into Africa in about, in about 765 AD. And they made, they made, they made a, a religious uh, uh, penetration into Africa and what they call the search of the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. They wanted to, they, they, because Africa had a reputation for having had a great amount of, of those uh, those minerals available, and so that's starting about 765. They continue to try to try to penetrate uh, Africa all the way up to about about the, into the early about 10th, 11th century, and you had a guy named Musa Musa, and then uh, he was that uh, he became he was and he was a sort of a king over Ghana and his Songhe empires and the rest of them, and he wanted to be able to, he wanted to sort of set up trade with 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 the Arabs at that point in time, so he had a pyramid going all the way to the Middle East. Trying to try and impress them, trying to get along with them, and uh, he was throwing gold and silver all along the road. And when they get, so finally, the Arabs again went after went after Af- went after uh, uh, after Africa, starting about the 11th century or so, and finally took it over about the 1200. That's when they, when, they, when, they, when Timbuktu fell. At that point in time, when they fell, the Arabs then said, "We got what we need in Africa now, and for Africa to continue to exist, and what we want, we're going to demand." that all of them began to do two, several things. One is that for them to, to adopt the Arab, the Moose Islam as their, as their religion. And two, that they began to qualify anybody who can be a public official to, be, to, to, to teach uh, Islam. And three, to, uh, to, they, to begin to accept uh, Arab names. And uh, so and Arabs then have, after the present time, has continued to try to per- penetrate Africa. That's why you got, you got enslavement still going on in, um, well, even before then, Arabs, Arabs shipped out about, they shipped out about 1 million blacks into slavery every, every 100 years. They've shipped over 13 million blacks into slavery around the world. And they're still enslaving blacks in Sudan, Ethiopia, and Mauritania for selling for about $150, $200 a piece today, right now. And what they were after in those countries like Mauritania and Sudan, they were after oil in those countries. And so it makes it very difficult for anybody to really seriously to, to, to consider, you gotta watch the religion, that's a horizontal issue anyway, because Arabs have been after, been after, Af, after Africa ever since about 765, and they got it now. And, uh, but now also on the top of that, most of the European nations in 18, 18, about 1886, they then went, had the Berlin Conference where they went in and started dividing Africa up into sections. And every country on earth got a piece of Africa to get the resources. And, to, and um, blacks are still under that colonization. And on top of that now, the Asians right now are pouring into Africa to take over the and control the resources. So uh, Africa has always been a sort of a mammary gland, a mammary gland where everybody's been sucking on Africa now for since about the 700s. All right. Okay, Dr. Anderson. So what I want to do is I'm going to ask uh, one more question before I let you go, because I know um, our time is pretty much up. Uh, May 5 is asking, are there any, are any of our athletes or entertainers chipping in uh, to the work that you're doing? He says, we know that Nas had the Powernomics tour. Are there any updates uh, on anything? Well, no, but I, you know, I have a lot of, uh, you know, I, I know they do the best they can. I don't want to bad mouth any of them, but they, 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 from what I hear at arms, I got a list yesterday of about 20 people, 20 uh, supposedly well-known athletes and entertainers that they support what I'm doing. And they, but they, they don't ever, they, I never get any resources, any monetary resources out of it. And I have the Harvest Institute, which is a nonprofit think tank, and they're about the only one of its kind in this nation. But um, whites won't give us any money, so, and I didn't want them, but they offered if I take the folks off of black folks, give me money, but I don't want their money. I'm not gonna take the folks off of black folk. But to date, I have not had any major, well-known, established 
black celebrity to give that one dime or one dollar. No, they've never given any money. But that, but that doesn't mean they're bad people. Just to, that's just not one of their priorities. But so, but that's okay. I'm gonna make it with. Yeah, I'll make it if, if I never get any money from them, because most of my money comes from small t blacks contributors across this country. We've been in existence now for for 26 years, just and we've been subsidized by low income blacks who give they give nickels, dimes, and dollars, and some of them get now. Even last time I went on your show, they started sending in fifteen hundred dollars. So we've been getting some money coming in, but. No, not one of them ever come and say, Dr. Dancer, here's, here's $100,000, here's $500,000. Go, go gear up and go across this nation and do what you want to do for our people. Not one has ever said that. Uh, they, they, what they typically say is that since I'm only focused and committed to black folk, I'm too black. And that doesn't bother me. That's the only ism I've ever, I'm always going to be into blackism and always. I'm not into all the other, other isms. I'm not into Confucianism, Hinduism, Islam, Protestantism, Catholic, Catholicism, none of those things. Um, I'm just into black folk, and I love black folk. And um, and I'm sorry to say, I wish some of, some of these big rich people would give us some money because they could write it off their taxes. They, they're not, they, they wouldn't lose anything because they're in a 50% tax bracket. If they got a $100 million contract for shooting basketballs, 50, 100, $50 million that going to the government. Mm -hmm. So, okay. All right. Well, well, what I want everybody to know, um, I see people asking, uh, and this is a good way to uh, finish the discussion. Um, I see a lot of people asking how they can help. Uh, the website to go make a donation is harvestinstitute.org. Uh, that's harvest yeah, yeah. Institute .org. Har harvest Institute dot harvest Institute dot org o r g dot org. And for Power Numbers Corporation, that's powernumbers dot com. So one's got to come after another one got org after. But no, we appreciate it. And you and, and, and your your listeners have done a magnificent job of making making contributions. I mean, the first time I went on you I went on your program, we probably got more money then and we've gotten in shoot, maybe in five years. Just the, 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 that that's how as I am gonna confess in this publicly now, maybe I shouldn't be doing this, but our budget last year was only about thirty five thousand dollars. And so, I mean, we don't, we don't get no, we don't get any big money. Most of the money comes from what I call, what I put in, for for giving speeches and running around the country and selling books. But I, but all my life I've been obsessed with the fact that I, I'm sick and tired of people beating up on black folk. I love black folk, mm -hmm. and that's why I fight so hard for them. Even though a lot of my friends who entertain us, very popular figures, you know, mm -hmm. I tell them I'm sorry, I'm so black. I'm not letting people beat up on black folk. I don't get money from most of the people I know, but. I'm gonna keep going, doing the best I can as long as I can. Well, you know, I, I think that's gonna change too. You know, first thing I'll say is I wasn't surprised when, when the people who come in here, the students in the Black Business School, stepped up for you because one of the things we tell people straight up from the beginning is that we really don't want, we don't want okie doke type people around. You know, we don't want people that's gonna sit around and just clap and say, "Oh, that's good. I, I feel inspired today." I want soldiers. You know, I want so and everybody ain't cut out to be a soldier. We know that. Like the military, you know, what, 5 10% of the population, something like that. You know, whatever. I don't know whatever the percentage is. So everybody isn't going to be a soldier. Everybody's not there to be security, but somebody has to do it. And so really the people that 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 are watching are you know, they're pioneers. They're not scared to think outside the box. They're tired of the bullshit. They're ready to build something new. They're ready to make a sacrifice or an investment in the future. I don't even call it a sacrifice. It's an investment. An investment means that whatever you are putting in, you're going to get something back tenfold. You know, so to me, if I'm supporting what you're doing with, with Poweronomics and with what you're doing with the Harvest Institute and what you're doing with that lawsuit on reparations, then uh, that helps us to achieve a goal together. So, you know, everybody in who's watching, you ain't got, it ain't just about the money. You know, if you, if your money's real messed up, then, then, that's okay. But just have the mindset that says, when you ask yourself, when you get done, you say, what can I do? How can I be an active participant in, in this goal? If you believe in it, if you don't believe in it, then there's nothing else to talk about. But if you believe right. in it, then just know that but, you, can't, you can't sit back and be a spectator. You got to get in the game. Dr. Anderson? Well, you, you're absolutely right. And, and that's why I said, I, I, don't, I don't want to put down any of these very popular figures. I know I think most of them got good hearts and they got good intentions, but I, I guess they never got around to it. But um, but I'm I'm going to keep pushing for black folk. I've done it now for my first year in politics. I was only 20 years of age. And I went with governors and presidents around the world. I've, I've conducted trade missions in, in third world countries. I'm anywhere from Venezuela, Colombia, Bermuda, Jamaica, Virgin Islands, Africa, 
Japan. I've been all around the world with presidents and governors. But by the same token, I've already maintained a consistent belief in my own people. And then I know some blacks are not, not worth a quarter. I know that. But the majority of black folk are very hardworking, honest people. And I, sometimes I feel a little sorry for them because they make their contributions and they're giving the best they can. They just don't have that much money. They don't have any wealth. And, and so we got the people in, I found out that the people who are really committed to trying to do something and they, and they, and they, and they would do anything possible to help the race, they don't have the resources. And those that do have it, they're not interested in doing anything. So that's the issue. It's just those that can, uh, won't do and those that 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 that, that won't it, it, it's just it's all messed up they just won't do they they just not going to do it and uh and i get offended when people tell me that dr that's well, you can get the money that you need to do the things for that you want for black folk if you only include all people you got you got to include asians arabs hispanic mexicans poor people crippled people million taller people people with hemorrhoids ingrown toenails everything i don't want to do that <laughs> so <laughs> i don't get the money but uh, but 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 I'm proud. <laughs> but I'm proud of you and your group. So, and uh, you all, you all, you all, giving us more money than than in, in 25 years. And uh, your students give more money in 25 years. I'll be in existence. And, uh, <laughs> and and we got lawsuits. We got we still back in the appeals court now. And after so we got one recent decision where the group group of black black Indians and black freedmen from Louisiana said, "Thank you, Dr. Anderson. We got a." We want we got this case that was uh, local judge rule on uh, district court rule. I, I guess about five or about four, three or four months ago, that says basically that I was absolutely right. The black folk entitled to billions of dollars, and uh, but they just they don't have the you don't have the political clout to do it. It's not an economic it's an economic issue, but you and if, and but you don't have the political clout from your own race or the economic clout from your own race. And they say what they do, they're running you through the court system so that, so that you burn up all your money and drain your capital. And, for, and, to, and to prevent that from happening, that's why my wife and I have never in 26 years ever taken a penny worth of income. We, have, we just don't, if necessary, we won't eat that day. Mm. Well, we don't, but we, we never draw a salary. We never get any compensation for doing this for 26 years all around this country, around the world for black folk. And well, so if any of the people want to send it, I would be, I would be most appreciative and shocked but I won't be disappointed because I don't, I don't expect anybody to help me. They haven't helped me in, two, in 50 years do this. I'm on my own. I know that. And I, I was, when I started out, I was started out on my own. Well, let me say this. Um, you know, I, I, I dare to say that you do deserve a salary. You deserve a big salary. Um, you know, you taking a salary does not take away from the mission at all. Uh, I think that we see, we see the community, the black community as sort of this failed charity case. And uh, when I look over at white folks that are doing good in the world, you know, whether you're talking about somebody that runs a religious, large religious organizations or, or large charities or whatever it is, or large investment companies, uh, they make sure their families are taken care of also. So uh, in my opinion, you do deserve to uh, be rewarded for the sacrifice you've made. But then also what I'll say is this, look, um, you know, there's 57,000 students in the Black Business School now. Um, I'm personally going to just ask everybody uh, who, in, in those who are not yet, who haven't joined yet, you know, feel free to, you know, come in and, and take a look. You're going to love what you see. It's a wonderful place. It is better than Wakanda because Wakanda owned, is owned by Disney and Wakanda ain't real. Uh, Wakanda is from that movie, The Black Panther. Uh, the Black Business School is real and it's owned by us. Uh, so go join for free. Go give it a try. We, we can give you a free class. It's better than any class you've ever taken in your life. So what I ask everybody who uh, believes in this mission to do, is to ask yourself, what can I support? Either I can go to the Harvest Institute and make a donation, which is fine, go to harvestinstitute.org. Uh, also, uh, if you want to support, uh, when we come through your city and we do the, or we come to a city near your city, you can always get on the, you know, get in the bus, get in the car, take a plane, people do that. People have flown from across the world to be at our events. Uh, when we come to your city, uh, get your children certified in Powernomics. Uh, get your children, bring, you know, bring your family. We'll give you a family discount, whatever it takes to get everybody in there from the family. Because what's going to happen, Dr. Anderson, is this. And I'm going to say this. This will be the last thing I'll say, and I'll let you get the last word. Is that my, the reason I know we're going to win this, this, this fight, the reason I know we're, we can't lose, because we're too smart, we're too, we, we've done too much, uh, we're too committed. The reason I know that we're going to win is because no matter what happens in the, this year, in the next five years, or in the next decade, the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, like uh, the rapper Tupac once said, 
that he said, I don't know if I can change the world, but I can change the mind of the person who might change the world. Mm -hmm. So what I really believe in the bottom of my heart, this is what keeps me going, is that there is some little kid about eight, nine, 10 years old right now who's watching these conversations with their daddy or their mama and they're being exposed to poweronomics at an early age. They don't know any other way to think. And this child is going to grow up, and their parents are going to prepare them for the battle. And that child is going to become a multi-billionaire. And that multi-billionaire that becomes a, a, a man or a woman is going to be raised in principles of, of Black economic strength and with an undying, unrelenting love and commitment to the Black community. And so I think that that might be the time where at that point, maybe in the year 2050 or 2070, that's when you're going to see that those economic resources where they, they've got, you know, five, six, seven hundred million dollars or a billion dollars behind their political campaign where they push forward and get what reparations, they get whatever it is that they're looking for. I think that the, the thing, the reason I say that is because I don't want us to get too caught up in despair based on what we're seeing right now. What we're seeing right now is nothing. It's like planting the seeds. Right now, you might only see dirt, you know, but, but in 100 years, you're going to see some sycamore trees, you know, because remember, a lot of people thought that a black man could never get into the White House. They, they would have guessed mm -hmm. it, it would took 100 years for that to happen. And, and you saw what occurred. Right. But without, you know, without Jesse Jackson running for president in the 80s, you wouldn't have had a Barack Obama without, you know, without the, the, the predecessors before Reverend Jackson, you wouldn't have had a Jesse Jackson. So. So, again, my point is that I believe that everything happens sort of in stages and in steps. So with you kind of originating some of the ideas that you laid out and you got the I'm sure you had inspirations as well. We are inspiring a whole generation of people. And I know with all the seeds that have been planted by these conversations, and by the time we're done, this discussion is going to be seen by 100,000 Black people. You can't tell me that there won't be some seeds planted that are going to grow into massive power structures in the next 40, 50 years. These kids are not going to be playing within, in the next generation. So I think that there's a lot of reason to be hopeful and to be excited and to be enthusiastic. Um, and and, and, and I, I want to say thank you for what you're doing uh, so far. Well, well, I thank you for those comments. And, uh, and I, I, I must confess that I am violating all the basic rules in business. Because typically in a business, as you know, the first thing you should do is take a salary for yourself. Pay yourself before you pay anybody else. And see, and I don't do that. And uh, that, that's, I, I don't do that out of pure, unadulterated, virginous stupidity. Okay? I just don't, I just never done that. I just never, in all the things I've set up in business, I always, I've never drawn a salary in all the businesses stuff I've been working in. I've set up some of the biggest operations in the country. And um, I never drew a salary. So that's why I guess I'm, that's why I'm on the poor side. So that doesn't bother me. And secondly, is that because my primary thing is to be, I got to reverse what's been happening to black folk in my mind for the last 500 years. I got to, first of all, bring black folk together as a team. And I don't want them to be suspicious or suspect that somehow I'm ripping them off or taking something from them. That's why I don't they haven't taken a salary. That's why we don't have very much income. That's why I spend my own money to fight these battles for black folk. That's why when I, if I, go, to go, I go on different speaking engagements, they can't even afford to buy the books. I have to give the books to them. Because they said, Dr. Els, you love us, so we, don't, we shouldn't have to pay you. And so I said, that's okay. But I want blacks to start playing as a team because we never played as a team. And as a consequence, one of the things I'll be addressing in your program on these uh, tours is that that's why we've never, we only people have been, been acculturated to be individuals, to never play as a team. That's why we never got a score on the board and we never won a game. We're the only people that want to, that want to, that want to be individuals in a group, in a group sport. Racism is a team sport. It's a team sport in, 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 in operating. It's a team sport in, being, in defending against it. We don't want people to go out on a field, in a football field, to play against another team. And we, won't, and we don't want to play as a team. We don't want to wear the same, uni, same color uniform. We want to wear a white uniform or anybody else's uniform rather than wearing our skin color uniform. We do, we want, we, if somebody throws us the ball, we'll grab the damn ball and intention run the wrong way if we can. Or we take the ball home to keep it Rather than to, or we tackle our own man, we see him running around across the field with the ball. We will throw him, knock him down, and if, we, if they call the signals in the huddle, we go up to the go to the stand, tell everybody else what we're up to. We do that, but my my goal in life was to get black folk to come as a team and learn how to acquire wealth and power, be able to defend themselves, and have some self respect, and tell the entire world that they are special people, they're exceptional people, and that's why that's they are native people. They are not a guest in this country. Black folk are not a guest any place. And I want, before I die, I want black folks to stand and tell people, we're not guests in America. 
we're not guessing. Social, social integration made us a guess. I was opposed to that when back in the civil rights movement with Martin Luther I'm going into someone else's neighborhood, going into somebody else's hotel, somebody else's restaurant, that makes me a guest. Not that I'm opposed to them. And everybody's got a right to go eat and sleep wherever they want to. But I, I hate to my bottom of my soul for black folk always being treated as a guest. Well, we are the oldest people in this nation, the oldest people on the earth. The 99 and one half percent of all the people right now in America are the direct descendants of slaves which meant they were here before 99% of all the other people coming in from Europe, Asia, Latin America ever arrived. We are the native people. We are native blacks. We're not African-American. We're not Caribbean. We are native blacks, the direct descendants of slaves. We're entitled to appreciation, respect, and recognition, and reparations for what we've contributed to building this country and building a darn world. And that's the bottom line of what I'm trying to do with my little Harvest Institute. Even though I don't get the money, no, these big entertainers don't ever give me the money. I still love them. You don't give me the money. But I, if they did, I would be very happy. If they don't, I'm not going to be sad. I love you all and love your students. All right. Well, well, we love you, too. We love you, too. So everybody who wants to support, and I know some of y'all in here are ballers, so don't be acting cheap now. You weren't acting cheap when Disney put out that movie last week, so don't be cheap now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. But they, they, I don't know if you saw it, Dr. Anderson. That movie's made almost a billion dollars now, and black folks carried that movie big time. So uh, whatever. I, 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 guarantee, I guarantee the Harvest Institute won't get a penny of that money. <laughs> well, you know what? I think you're going to get more than a penny I, I, because I, I'm going to tell you what, I, what I've told people, and I'll tell you guys this again, is uh, one good benchmark to decide, you know, how much you might want to support what Dr. Anderson is doing with the lawsuits and everything is uh, look at how much money you spent the night you went to see the Black Panther. If you took, you know, your, 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 your two kids and your spouse, you know, and, and then got the $5 popcorn and everything else and, uh, and then went out to dinner, you probably, you might've dropped as much as a hundred dollars, maybe $60, maybe $50, whatever number you spent. Uh, look at that number and just say, that uh, the amount that I support Disney, I'm going to also support uh, what Dr. Anderson is doing. That might be a good benchmark so that you can just, you know, you know chip in. That's all we, we ask you to do is just chip in right. to what he's doing because his money's going to real expenses to pay real lawyers. Uh, also, if you want to go deeper, uh, you know, some sort of consistent relationship, like I said, we are, uh, we're going to go to a lot of cities doing these Poweronomics certifications. Every city we go to is going to cost us twenty five to $30,000 to set up shop in that city. So uh, your support makes it uh, possible for us to do this. You will walk away with uh, a benefit that is far greater than anything you could have ever gotten from that $50,000 a year university you went to. Uh, we love you, we care about you, we are here for you. And so, uh, and if you don't feel that way, then we also have money back guarantees and everything else in place. So there's no risk whatsoever, but bills have to be paid, things have to be done. And in order for those things to get done, Every, you know, it, sometimes ain't nothing going on but the rent when you are paying tens of thousands of dollars every month to operate and educate black folks. But we've got an engine. We have a system. We have a process. The system's working. And that's why people are threatened by this, because we are disrupting and undermining uh, power structures that have benefited tremendously from black folks being sloppy and uneducated. Uh, as, as I told you guys not too long ago, I had a conversation with a guy, a white guy, Dr. Anderson. I never told you about this conversation, but there was a, a guy I talked to. Uh, he's a very libertarian white guy. He has a lot of money. I'm talking about a billion dollars or so. And one of the things that he said, I, I talked to him a little bit about what I did. I just mentioned it. And uh, he said, uh, he said, be very careful. He said, because what you're doing when you're educating millions of black people on economic intelligence, uh, developing businesses, keeping their resources, uh, you know, questioning the Democratic Party. He said, there's a lot of people who will feel uncomfortable about that and they're gonna shoot back at you. He said, he said be ready for every dirty trick, be ready for every uh, type of attack, be ready for everything. He said, because you can't run up on the beaches of Normandy and, and then get upset because they, they shooting back. He said, he said, if you go in and you take in something that somebody else feels like they own, and everybody feels like they own black people. Everybody got their little teeth and they got their little chunk of the black community. When you take something that other people feel like they own, then they're going to fight you to the death for it. So uh, I'm ready for the fight, and I know you are. And, uh, and so everybody else in here, I want to say thank you guys uh, for being a part of this. Uh, you know, we can't do this without you. Uh, so thank, thanks a lot, Dr. Anderson. You know, I right, right, and thank you. And thank you for pushing the, uh, the uh, Harvest Institute and uh, NMA major contributors uh, would be uh, definitely appreciated. But keep in mind, tell them that not only 1866, we got almost five major lawsuits 
in these lawsuits, each one stands for for billions and billions of dollars. And I, what I what I try to do is to try to push for reparation on, for Black folk, not based on emotionalism, and uh, and but based on mere facts that we that we are a nation of laws, and the highest law in this country are treaty laws. And all I ask the society to do is to effectuate or enact or enforce the laws that are already on the books in behalf of Black folk. And mm-hmm. cease and desist in mistreating black folk and misusing and abusing. That's why I'm not a civil rights leader, and I don't get, I don't play that game. I'm not look, trying to save the world. I'm trying to save black folk. And if they never give me one penny, I could care less. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thanks again, Dr. Anderson, and uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, by next week, I should have some data for you and information for you about the Powernomics tour. If you ever want to just get text message alerts. Uh, but when I might go live, stuff like that, you can actually text the word voice to 31996, text the word voice, B-O-Y-C-E, to 31996, and you'll be on our text message list. I can shoot you a text, let you know what's going on. Uh, also, if you want to make a donation to the Harvest Institute, the URL, please write it down. Please share it. Please tell everybody. Everybody go tell somebody on social media. It's harvestinstitute.org. That's harvestinstitute.org. I have no doubt that out of the, out of the 100,000 people that will see this video, one of y'all, at least one of y'all, probably got a, a, a cousin or a brother who plays for the Seattle Supersonics who's, who's dropping $100,000 in the strip club. Tell him to go drop $100,000 on the Harvest Institute, and I'll, and I'll publicly thank him for his donation. I will publicly acknowledge anybody who goes in and, 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 and helps set the budget uh, for the organization. I know I'm going to do my part, but that's not going to be enough. I, I need everybody's help on this. So you guys take care. Have a great day. And uh, it's good to see you again, Dr. Anderson. I guess I'll see you next week. Thank you, buddy. When you get a chance, give me a call, okay? Yes, sir. I certainly will. I certainly will. And have a pleasant day. You too. And tell, okay. tell all your students I love them. Yes, I will. They heard you. All right. Take care. Okay. Of yourself, sir. All right. All right. Bye-bye now.